Hi, welcome to the Bible Channel by Christadelphian Video. I have a two part series for you now called The Woman and the Dragon. Now these presentations discuss the complex aspects of Revelation chapter 12. And they focus on the two dragons, three women and non-chronological verses. They delve into the symbolism of the Roman Empire transitioning into Christianity under the Emperor Constantine with a detailed analysis of key events like the casting out of pagan Rome and Constantine's rise to power. The defeat of the po pagan dragon by Constantine and the establishment of Christianity as the dominant religion are highlighted in these episodes as key themes well worth a watch by brother Stephen Hornhart presented at the Daventry Study Fraternal Weekend on the 1st of June 2024. Hope you enjoy them. If you want to watch the video versions of these, head over to the Bible channel on YouTube or ChristadelphianVideo.org where they're featured. Thank you. God bless. Now, in this first presentation, Brother Stephen discusses the challenging aspects of Revelation 12. The chapter includes two dragons and three women, with verses that do not follow a chronological order. The speaker explains that the first six seals of Revelation are the fulfilment of the words in 2 Thessalonians 2, leading up to the casting out of pagan Rome. The opening of the seventh seal signifies the silence in the political heavens of Rome after Constantine becomes the Christian Emperor. We then look at the cry of the believers that goes up to God, questioning how long the judgments will take. Brother Stephen then also mentions this despotic rule of the Roman Emperor Diocletian. This sets the stage for the content of the Revelation world, where the rule of the four is established with two Augusti and two Junior Caesars. The speaker bridges the gap between the fourth and the fifth seals leading into the sixth. Hope you enjoy them. Now we've got quite a challenge in our two studies. Having read through that chapter again, you read through those details and you think, hmm, some of us in this audience have got a good handle on this chapter. To those all will say, this will be very good revision. Some of us would have read through this chapter and thought, I think I've got some kind of understanding here, but oh, some of that detail just leaves me a little bit cold or distant. And, and some of us in the audience would be reading this perhaps and thinking, I know very little. So we do have a diversity, I'm sure, as in most Christadelphian audiences, when it comes to this book called the Apocalypse. Why is the chapter so challenging? Well, one of the main centerpieces of the chapter is the Great Red Dragon. But of course, that Great Red Dragon changes into another dragon. So in this chapter, we have two dragons. And another centerpiece in this chapter is a woman. Both with the sun, moon, out of the feet, twelve stars are over her head. But that woman splits, and one woman runs away from this woman. So you have two women in this chapter. Oh no, the woman that runs away is made up of two women. So we have three women in this chapter. So two dragons and three women. We need to work out how this dragon changes, why this dragon changes. When this dragon changes, we need to work out a woman. How this woman split into two? And then this one that runs away, how is she again split into two? Now, adding to the challenge of the chapter, two dragons, three women, we have verses that do not run chronologically. You have some verses that take you into the future and then bring you back. In fact, there are some verses, one verse, we might need to chronologically put the end part of the verse at the front of the verse and the front part of the verse at the latter part of the verse. So is anyone in the room that would like to now go out and have a coffee? <laughs> it's challenge, but, but can we understand it? Absolutely. 
because this is a letter written by our Lord Jesus Christ to his bride. Now, brothers and sisters, now reading up the great drama of Revelation 12, which is in fact linked to the last six verses of Revelation 6. I mean, in Revelation 6, we have the six seals. So many of us in the room would know that the last six verses of chapter 6 gives you an overview of the first great earthquake. Pagan Rome rolled away. And to get the detail of the sixth seal, the last six verses, we need to couple that with Revelation 12. So we bring Revelation 12 coupled together with the last six verses of Revelation 6. Now, when we look at the seal, we are not, of course, going to look at it in any detail this afternoon. But when you look at these six seals moving through, these are leading inexorably to the first great earthquake, the casting out of pagan Rome. As you move through these first six seals, these are a fulfillment of the words of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7. Let's just remind ourselves, brothers and sisters, there might be some in the room that are not perhaps necessarily that familiar with the way in which the seals, the first six seals, are a fulfillment of Paul's words in the second of Thessalonians and chapter 2. So second Thessalonians 2, and we read from verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity is already at work in the ecclesia, Paul says. But only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now, when this person who was letting an old English word, so I'm an English company now, you know this before, me, I'm a colonialist from Australia. So this is an old English word, he now let it, it's, it's the word restrain. So Paul says there's a, there's a secret lawlessness that's moving through the ecclesia right way, way back there, but it's being restrained over here. Who restrains this secret of this, this mystery of iniquity? will do so until he who restrains it is removed. And, of course, the restraint here is isn't it? It's paid in front. This is the Roman Empire. This is the, the emperors. And so seals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 are the taking away, the details of the taking away of this restrainer. And then when pagan Rome is removed from us, sisters, then we have the coming of Constantine, who then brings in the man of sin. So, in summary, seal one through six are the outworking of the, of the, of the fulfillment of the words of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7. So you could very well write in that section in there, fulfilled in the first six seals. Ah, but also, brothers and sisters, as we get to the end of the sixth seal, or the end of Revelation 12, again, a fulfillment of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7. So let's now go into Revelation 8, verse 1. So the first six seals, a fulfillment of 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 7. The restraint is removed. Pagan Rome is gone. Now, the apostasy can blossom. You use that expression, not a nice word to use. It's not a great word to use, but yes, now the apostasy can flourish. Now, when we come to Revelation 8 and verse 1, we find this is a fulfillment of Revelation of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7. Because in Revelation 8 and verse 1, this is the opening of the seventh sin. So the first way to explain is gone. Chapter 12 is gone. Now we begin chapter 8 and verse 1. We're at AD 324. And in Revelation 8 and verse 1, and when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about the state of heart and animal. Silence in the political heavens of Rome. Constantine has taken the West in AD 312. Constantine, after 12 years of wars and wars and wars, has now beaten the dragon, the pagan dragon, 
And now Constantine is the Christian emperor of the West and the East. And it is AD 324. It is the opening of the seventh seal. And there's silence in the political heavens of Rome. We're about the space of half an hour. And we're, going to go, we're not going to go through that time period. Some of you have got that written in your margin. So in your margins, um, what is this time period of about the space of half an hour? What have you written there? How many years? Sorry. 14 years. The tricky bit is it's about the space of half an hour. So it's 14 years, and, and we're not going to go through how do you get that, because I'm up to probably right. 14 years, about the space of half an hour. It is the time from when Constantine has now taken the world. AD 324. 14 years later, it is AD 337. The Constantine dies. And there's chaos. There's no more silence. So when you read that verse, verse 1 of chapter 8, Constantine's coming, the seventh seal is open, everything is tranquil politically, socially, and then 14 years later, we'll just turn over the page just so that we do see the connection. We turn the page over and we pick up the record in verse 5. And the angel, chapter 8, verse 5, and the angel took the censer, filled it with the fire of the altar, cast it into the earth, and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings. Full stop. We don't read the next bit, because the next bit is years later. There were voices and thunderings and lightnings. A.D. 337. Constantine is dead. The 14 years of silence in heaven is now past. It's 337 A.D. Now, just if you haven't got this note in your margins, the next little bit of that last verse, and then there was an earthquake. That's A.D. 361. That's years down the track when Constantine's nephew, Julian, says, what's going on? This Christian empire, there are chaos all over the place. There are bishops in Alexandria. There are bishops in Nicodemia. There are bishops in Constantinople. There are bishops in Rome, all at each other's throat. Is Jesus God? Is Jesus a man? It's chaos. Constantine's sons are trying to divide up the, up the, the Roman world. It was chaos. Lightnings and thunders and voices after the death of Constantine. And so in AD 361, an earthquake happens. Julian, Constantine's nephew, says, well, if this is Christianity, it's out. And for two years, he came in and brought back pagans. Okay. So in, in Revelation 8 and verse 1, we have a fulfillment of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The pagan Roman world would suppress the apostasy. It wouldn't allow the apostasy to develop until pagan Rome was removed and then the development of the apostasy. All right, having said that, brothers and sisters, and having said, yes, and people, having said that moving through these six seals, we get to the conclusion of that verse thing. And here are our six or our first. Four signals, and we're going to just now very briefly look at the way in which they spill into a cry that goes up to God in the big seal. So, as we start the first seal, we read of the white horse, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And the objective of the first seal was to weaken and weaken and weaken and weaken the pagan Roman world until finally the great earthquake and it's rolled away in the sixth seal like a scroll. But as this pagan Roman world, I mean, 84 years of peace, 31 years of civil war, 24 years of terrible injustice, and 68 years of death, and you get to this fourth seal and the pagan Roman empire is like an old shuttly horse a skinny breath, hardly able to move, and God is weakening and weakening, ready for the apostasy to come into play. But in all the way through this, brothers and sisters and young people, we get to the fifth seal and a cry goes up. A cry goes up. 
by our brothers and sisters. And they cry, having, having gone through all of these years of, of, of awfulness in the Roman pagan world, the cry goes on, and our brothers and sisters cry with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, is thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth, the pagan world? But you know, our brothers and sisters call God a despot. In a fancy calling God a despot. How long, O oh, despotes? This is the only time in the book of Revelation where the word despot is used. And here are the brothers and sisters calling God a despot. Why? Why would they refer to God as despotes in this context? Well, the reason, brothers and sisters, is because there was a despot ruling from Rome. And he was Diocletian. And he was the greatest Roman emperor to sit upon the throne since Octavian Augustus, the emperor at the birth of Christ. And this Diocletian was a despot. <coughs> or Roman emperors before him, they wore the lorette. They wore the coronal wreath, not him. He wore a diadem. And when, Di and when Diocletian moved around his, his palace, he moved around with long flowing robes. And when he walked around with his diadem and his long flowing robes, he walked around like he was gliding on ice. And people would go, is he Roman? He looks more like a king. And he wanted to send that, that idea out to others. <clears throat> he, brothers and sisters, was not going to allow any thug with a sword to take his empire. He was not going to allow any rich man to come along as it had done in the past and open up his wallet and say, well, I've got plenty of money. I think I'll buy the emperorship. No. He wasn't going to allow any crowd or mob to store his palace. And so he turned his palace into a city. And if you gained audience to this man, unlike in previous times where you approached an emperor, you would go down on your knee, you would put your hand on your chest, you would look and stare the emperor in the eye. You would stand up. You would take a step back. And that's how you would dress, not this man. If you gained audience with this man, you had to lay flat on your face, which I'll not demonstrate. You will lay flat on your face three times. And then when you stood up, you were not allowed to look him in the eye. He was a despot. And therefore the hubbub and the, and the, and the, and the, the murmuring in the marketplaces and in the stalls of this particular empire, they were coming. Who is the true despot? The Lord God holy and true, or Diocletian unholy and untrue? And our brothers and sisters were crying to God in the face of this man and saying to God, You only are our true despot. Despite the power and the influence of this man, we will not give our hearts to him, although he demands it. We are going to give our hearts to you and only you in the face of terrible persecution. That's why, brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters cry to God, how long does this have to go on? And God would say to our brothers and sisters, you don't have to wait long. There's coming a time when men like that will be eradicated from this world and that came in the first great earth that came in with the removal of pagan Rome. So, brothers and sisters, this sets the scene up to the content of Revelation as well. Because what Diocletian did in the fourth seal, he was the last emperor of the fourth seal, he was the first emperor of the fifth seal. What Diocletian did in the fourth seal the pale wolves, he divided the empire into a tetrarchy, into a rule of four. So you have an Augusti in the west, and you have an Augusti in the east. And then you had a Junior Caesar. And there we have. We have the Augusti in the west, Maximian, and Constantius, the Junior Caesar. Constantius being the father of Constantine. And you had Diocletian, the Augusti in the east, and Galerius 
this number study that Junior Cedar, a rule of law. What happened? I'm just setting the scene here now to bring us into Revelation 12, bridging the gap from the fourth seal, the fifth seal is our back right now. How long? How long is this going to go on for? I'm bridging the gap between the fourth, the fifth seal, into the sixth seal of Revelation 12. Four emperors, two Augusti, two Junior Caesars, set up by that man, the ruler of the Tetrarchy. Well, what happened, brothers and sisters? Is that Diocles abdicated from the throne. He got ill and he sat down. Even though he was ill and he sat down and was still pulling the strings of the puppets beneath him, he was still in the background with some evil But you now had Galerius take the role of the, of the Augusta. Then we had a new servant come on the scene, Maxentius, who ruled in Rome, promising the Christians all of these lovely goodies, and he wheeled his way into Rome. But then we have another person come on the scene, Licinius, the brother-in-law to Constantine. And then we had another person come on the scene, a cruel pagan who hated a Christian with a passion, Maximian. We're not going to go through all this history, but I just want to show you. One, two, three, four, five, six. We need three, because Revelation 12 demands it. Three, because in Revelation 12, the pagan dragon with his tail draws the third part of the stars of heaven. We need three. And so what happened, brothers and sisters, it is this. This forecast I disappears, and Constantius now becomes the August One, two, three, four, five. We need two more to go. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five. We need more to go. We need three. And Revelation 12 demise. So, brothers and sisters, Constantius dies, and Constantine, now elected by his men in a fervor of enthusiasm over there in England. This man is not very handy. Galerius is a pagan through and through. He does not like Constantine. He is determined to kill Constantine. How dare you, you over there in England, elect this man? I'm in charge, says Galerius, and therefore he was very agitated. Well, brothers and sisters, we've got one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five still. So what happens now is that Constantine is about to move down into Rome. But before he does, in 312, Galerius dies in 311. Now we've got four. Constantine now sweeps down from York in England and as he comes down, brothers and sisters, exactly with my little point of view, but now I can't get my left and right. So Constantine helps down into, well, just outside of Rome at the Milvian Bridge. And in 312, Constantine beats Maxentius, the pagan emperor. And now, brothers and sisters, we have three. Constantine, Licinius, and Maximin. And Constantine would at Milvian Bridge, as many of you would know, supposedly has a vision, and the vision that he has, a cross superimposed upon the sun. And he hears a voice, and the voice says, in this sign, conquer. Now, what did he see? What did he put on the shields of his men? Well, what he did, brothers and sisters, is they you have the Greek word for Christ. And the two first letters of the Greek word for Christ are the letters chi rho, X, P. And so Constantine had that symbol, the first two letters of the name Christ, painted on the shields of his men. And with that, he marched into Rome and defeated Maxentius. And now, brothers and sisters, this man Constantine, the man-child, of Revelation 12 is politically born. Because in Revelation 12, it says the dragon stood there about to devour the child as soon as it was born. Constantine is politically born in 312. He is now the emperor of the West, having marched with that symbol 
the Leveron, the XP, the Kai Ro. Now the scene is set, brothers and sisters, for Revelation 12. And the detail of the sixth seal, the detail of the first great earthquake of the apocalypse. And it's tailed through the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. His tail. Well, it's not Constantine's tail because he's not pagan. It's either Licinius, Constantine's brother in law, or it's Maximian. So, how did it, well, how did it pan out, brothers and sisters? Our brothers and sisters in the fifth seal cried, How long, O despotes, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell upon the earth? God says, You don't have to wait long. I'm going to roll this pagan Roman word and cast it away. And so, brothers and sisters, we move now into the sixth seal and connecting verses, the last six verses of chapter six with Revelation chapter 12. Now, just, just, just as a little stepping stone into chapter 12, you would be aware of this, that this earthquake is a political earthquake, but of course it is. Some of you will have these two quotations in your margin. If some of the young ones don't, it's a very good two quotations to write next to this, which show us that the earth and the heavens are respectively or yes, having reference to people, the earth, and of course, rules the heavens. So we won't go back to those two quotations, but what I want to do is this. Sometimes people read this, this section of Revelation chapter 6 and go, oh, this must be talking about Israel. It's talking about a fig tree. This has got to be something to do with Israel. Oh, maybe the holy city is Israel. Maybe the beast is Israel. No. But it's talking with symbol. It, it, it can't be Gentile powers. Well, you might like to make a note of this, brothers and sisters, and that is this quotation. We won't turn it up, but if you go to Isaiah 34 and verses 4 through 5, you see the same language used in Isaiah 34 and verse 4 and 5, and it's, it's talking in the context of a heaven departing as a scroll and in the context of a fig tree, and it's not about Israel. It's about Edom. So that's a very good quotation to show that we are not in the context of Israel, but legitimately in the context of a Gentile nation. So you might want to jot that down and have a look at that in your leisure. All right, brothers and sisters, this chapter 12 is the first of the three great earthquakes of the apocalypse. I think all of us in the room would know where the three great earthquakes are. End of chapter 6, end of chapter 11, end of chapter 16, the three great earthquakes. What we do need to make sure of is this. We already referred to Revelation 8 and verse 5, when there were voices and thunderings and lightnings, AD 337, when Constantine died, and then in AD 361, there was an earthquake, a little earthquake, a two-year removal of Christianity and the incoming of paganism. So this little earthquake here is not number three. Brethren and sisters, young people, just also note Revelation 11, verse 19. Let's just turn that up very quickly. Make sure that we cover that. So if some of the younger ones or the younger ones in the truth are looking at oh, the three great earthquakes, yep, chapter 6, chapter 11, chapter 16. What about this one in, uh, in Revelation 11 and toward the end of the chapter? Now, just in passing, verse 13, chapter 11, we did this at the Bible school. Verse 13, the same hour there was a great earthquake. This is the second great earthquake of the apocalypse. This is the French Revolution. Let's put that to one side. Now have a look at verse 19 of Revelation 11. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. Now, some of you will have in your margin, 
This is exactly the same earthquake as in Revelation 16. This is the earthquake between Armageddon and the beginning of the millennium. So this one, although it doesn't say a great earthquake, it certainly says great hail, which is the language of Revelation 16. So just, just a little note, in case we trip over that when we're doing our readings. That earthquake at the end of chapter 11 is the third great earthquake referred to in chapter 16. All right? Who didn't have that in their margin to start with? Well, good. That's excellent. So let's start something. All right. Okay, brother and sister. Skip through this. Skip through this. Time is the enemy. Right. Linking the last six verses of chapter 6, the first great earthquake, to chapter 12. They are hand in glove. They are talking about the same event. Let's have a little in the chart here to show you the similarity of language. In chapter 6, we have in verse 12 a great earthquake. The correlation or the parallel to that is in Revelation 12 in verse 7. Pagans have been cast out. Michael, he who like God, Constantine. So there is the, the there is the comparison. There is the same event that's taking place. We have the language in verse 13 of chapter 6. The stars of heaven fell to the earth. The pagan Roman administration was demolished. But in verse 4 of chapter 12, the dragon draws the third part of the stars of heaven. You have similar language. In Revelation 6 and verse 12, you have the sun blackened and the moon turned to blood. In verse 1 of chapter 12, ah, the sun's back, not black, it's back. The moon is not blood anymore, it is now brightly burning under the feet of this woman. So here's a woman now clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. And then in Revelation 6, you have these people running around saying, oh, fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. These are the pagans running away from Constantine and his army. And in Revelation 12, you have another group saying, oh, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. So you can see we have a legitimacy in drawing the last six verses of chapter 6 into Revelation and chapter 12. All right, brothers and sisters, Revelation 12, and I know you won't see that text at this stage. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to highlight some colours. The hub of this chapter, war in the political heavens, war for Rome. There was war in heaven. It wasn't just one war. This went on year after year after year. This went on, brothers and sisters, from AD 312 to AD 324, Revelation 8, verse 1. And it says there that Michael, Constantine, and his army fought against Licinius, his brother-in-law. Licinius is the, is the major character, the major antagonist in this against Constantine. So Constantine and his brother-in-law are there featured in this verse. Constantine and Licinius fought it out year after year. And then finally, Licinius, the pagan dragon, was cast out that old serpent. Now, brothers and sisters, just so we understand the content of this chapter, it's imperative that we understand the two dragons. When you're reading through this, you don't have this coloured in. There's a pagan dragon and there's a Christian dragon. You've got to do the same thing with the women. You've got to colour in three different women. Otherwise, you get all confusion. And where am I here? Who's this? Who's... So now, there are the colours of the pagan dragon. So there you go. If you were to colour that in, let me just give you a minute for those of you who are... Was well, that gone off the screen, has it? No. Oh. Okay. I'll just leave that there. But now, if you want to enter into that little colouring exercise now... Please do. So just give you a couple of seconds for those who would like to colour that in. Because in a moment, we're going to flick over and see a Christian dragon. We'll colour that in a different colour. And that helps to allow this chapter to open up. 
Give me a copy of these slides if you want to. If anyone would like a copy of all these, we certainly can make them available. So what I'll do, brothers and sisters, I'll just flick this up here and just allow you, if you so desire, to cover the rest of it. So we have, I think most of us have kind of got that down there. Let's now just, got 17 little colored squares in there. You've got the abide amount. The Great Red Dragon. Now we're going to finish our study on this note. That up. There is the Christian dragon. The dragon has changed from pagan to Christian. Constantine now is a adversary against the brothers and sisters. So he's the man child. He's the Michael. He's the serpent in verse 14, the serpent in verse 15. He's the dragon in verse 16 and 17. Is there one down the bottom here? No. So I'll leave that there and I'll just get you to colour those in. Now you've got clearly delineated in this chapter the two dragons. One disappears and a Christian dragon comes in on the scene. How do we prove this is right? We have a dragon with seven heads and ten horns. Where would I go to prove that this is right? Somebody says to you, ah, oh, Ryan, come on. My cow, no way. How can I prove this is Rome? Where would I go? How about Revelation 17? We'll finish on this note. Revelation 17. We've got seven heads and ten horns. So we go to Revelation 17. And we pick up the verse in verse 9. Some of you, this is old territory. But I wonder whether we'll be able to explain this. Now, brothers and sisters, I just got your attention right now. You've just turned up to Revelation 17 and verse 9. We're going to say something here. This is what I want you to grasp. The seven heads are seven forms of government. By the fallen, one is, one is yet to come. When he comes, he must continue a short space. The one that was and is not, even he is the eight, and is of the seven, and goeth into petition. I want us to clearly understand that before we leave today. By the fall, one is one is yet to come. When he comes, he must continue a short space. The one that was and is not even his, the eight and the seven, and go into petition. Look how easy this is. It's not a quadratic equation. Look how easy this is. Well, the first thing we see to prove this is Rome is the geographic location. Well, this is easy. This is the simple bit. The woman that thou sawest is one sits among seven hills. The seven hills are seven mountains upon which the woman sits. Now we've seen this coin, Roma, and there's a woman sitting among seven hills or seven mountains. But, but Rome's not the only city that sits among seven hills. So that's not enough proof for me. This brother's existence is amazing. Verse 10, there are seven forms of government. This is the political identification of this beast, this seven-headed beast. And then we read in these verses, John, seven forms of government. Well, to let you know who this monster is with the seven heads. Seven forms of government. Five are fallen, and five forms of government had been in existence prior to AD 96, and those five forms of government were regal, consular, dictatorial, disembowel, tribunition. 700 years BC, Rome was ruled over by a king. 500 BC, Rome became a republic, and they were ruled over by two consuls. Yes, they had the Senate. People could speak through the Senate on the matters of legislation. But they had two consuls ruling as Rome was a republic. But every now and then, they had social upheaval. They had conflict between two classes of people. And every now and then, Rome had to bring in a dictator to sort out internal squabbles or issues on the border. So Rome had a dictatorial form of government. Or there was still some chaos going on in Rome. And so they said, let's go across to Greece. Find out how they did it. So they brought back ten lords, the rule of ten, Desi, Desi Byron. Still had their two morals, and some people said, no, we want to have a better form of government. So, so the plebeian class of people 
push their tribunes and tribunicial form of government. Five forms of government had existed. John, one form of government is, when John was there in AD 96, the imperial empress ruled in Rome. And then John, the other one is yet to come. The Goths came in and ruled in Rome. Goths, barbarians, but they loved the Roman ways. So in came the Goths, and they ruled in Rome, dressed up in all the Roman regalia, even said to the emperor over in Constantinople, we love Rome, don't kick us out, we'll do what you want us to do. So the Goths ruled in Rome for 60 years. When he comes, the seventh head, he's going to continue a short state for 60 years. Now, that's the easy bit. John, seven heads, seven forms of government. By the fallen, one is imperial, one is yet to come. When he comes, he must continue a short space. How are your heads so far? You with us? Okay. That's the easy bit. This is the tricky bit. The one that was and is not, if it is the eighth and of the seven and goeth into perdition. Now, have a look at this one. <laughs> How easy this is. By the fallen, one is, that's where John is. The other is not yet come. The seventh head is not yet come. When the Goths do come, they'll only continue for 16 years. Okay. By the fallen, one is, one is yet to come. John, go over there and stand there in the future with the Goths. Now, John, look back. John's here. The one that was, was John's here. The one that was and is not, is not because he's here. Even he is the eight and is one of the sin. Simple as that. And if you want a lovely cross reference, well, it's existence, just turn up to Revelation 13 and verse 3. The one that was and is not, because John's looking at that, there's a resurrection, there's a re emergence of the imperial head coming after the gods, way, way after the gods, not straight away. Revelation 13 and verse 3. And I saw one of his heads, the sixth head, Wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and he became the eighth. Right there, that's existence. Revelation 13 and verse 3. What an amazing book this is. Yes, it's history. Yes, it requires a little bit of math to work it out. But what an astounding book. So, brothers and sisters, we are then in our next study, we wrap this one up now, in our next study, we're going to put out both feet in Revelation chapter 12, walk through the rest of Revelation 12, and see this amazing drama as it unfolds, as this war goes on between Constantine and his brother-in-law, and we see these women involved in this chapter, amazingly the way in which God, our God in heaven, places this on record to thrill you and me, to prove to you and me unequivocally that this is, in fact, the Word of God. quite a challenge in our two studies. Having read through that chapter again, you read through those details and you think, hmm, some of us in this audience have got a good handle on this chapter. Those all the same, this will be very good revision. Some of us would have read through this chapter and thought, I think I've got some kind of understanding here, but oh, some of that detail just leaves me a little bit cold or distant. And some of us in the audience will be reading this perhaps and thinking, I know very little. So we do have a diversity, I'm sure, as in most Christadelphian audiences, when it comes to this book called the Apocalypse. Why is the chapter so challenging? Well, one of the main centerpieces of the chapter is the Great Red Dragon. But of course, that Great Red Dragon changes into another dragon. So in this chapter, we have 
two dragons. And another centerpiece in this chapter is a woman, clothed with a sun, moon at her feet, twelve stars are over her head. But that woman splits, and one woman runs away from this woman. So you have two women in this chapter. Oh no, the woman that runs away is made up of two women. So we have three women in this chapter. So two dragons and three women. We need to work out how this dragon changes, why this dragon changes, when this dragon changes. We need to work out a woman, how this woman split into two, and then this one that runs away, how is she again split into two? Now, adding to the challenge of the chapter, two dragons, three women, we have verses that do not run chronologically. You have some verses take you into the future and then bring you back. In fact, there are some verses, one verse, where you might need to chronologically put the end part of the verse at the front of the verse and the front part of the verse at the latter part of the verse. So is anyone in the room that would like to now go out and have a coffee? <laughs> it's challenge, but, but can we understand it? Absolutely. Because this is a letter written by our Lord Jesus Christ to his bride and brothers and sisters. Now, leading up to the great drama of Revelation 12, which is in fact linked to the last six verses of Revelation 6. I mean, in Revelation 6, we have the six seals. So, many of us in the group would know that the last six verses of chapter 6 gives you an overview of the first great earthquake. Pagan Rome rolled away. And to get the detail of the sixth seal, the last six verses, we need to couple that with Revelation 12. So we bring Revelation 12 coupled together with the last six verses of Revelation 6. Now, when you look at the sin, which we are not, of course, going to look at it in any detail this afternoon, but when you look at these six seals moving through, these are leading inexorably to the first great earthquake and casting out of pagan Rome. As you move through these first six seals, these are a fulfillment of the words of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7. It's just reminding ourselves, brothers and sisters, there might be some in the room that are not perhaps necessarily that familiar with the way in which the seals, the first six seals, are a fulfillment of Paul's words in the second of the Thessalonians in chapter 2. So, second Thessalonians 2, and we read from verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity is already at work in the ecclesia, Paul says. But only he who now letteth will let it until he be taken out of the way. Now, when this person who was letting, an old English word, so I'm an English company now, you know this before, me, I'm a colonialist, well, it's from Australia. So this is an old English word, he is now letting, is, is the word restraint. So Paul says there's a, there's a secret lawlessness that's moving through the ecclesia right way, way back there, but it's being restrained over I mean, here. He who restrains this secret of this, this mystery of iniquity will do so until he who restrains it is removed. And of course, the restraint here is isn't it? It's paid in front. This is the prime of the empire. This is the, the emperors. And so, seals one, two, three, four, five, and six are the taking away, the details of the taking away of this restrainer. And then when pagan Rome is removed from us, sisters, then we have the coming of Constantine, who then brings in the man of sin. So, in summary, seal one through six are the outworking of the, of the, of the fulfillment of the words of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7. So you could very well write in that section in there, fulfilled in first six seals. Ah, but also, brothers and sisters, if we get to the end of the sixth seal, or the end of Revelation 12, 
Again, a fulfillment of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7. So let's now go into Revelation 8 verse 1. So verse 6 seals, a fulfillment of 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 7. The restraint is removed, taken away is gone. Now the apostasy can blossom. You use that expression, not a nice word to use, it's not a great word to use, but yes, now the apostasy can flourish. Now when we come to Revelation 8 verse 1, we find this is a fulfillment of the that of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7. Because in Revelation 8 and verse 1, this is the opening of the seventh seal. So the first great earthquake is gone. Chapter 12 is gone. Now we begin chapter 8 and verse 1, we're AD 324. And in Revelation 8 and verse 1, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about the space of heart and animal. Silence in the political heavens of Rome. Constantine has taken the West in AD 312. Constantine, after 12 years of wars and wars and wars, has now beaten the dragon, the pagan dragon, and now Constantine is the Christian emperor of the West and the East, and it is AD 324, it is the opening of the seventh seal, and there's silence in the political heavens of Rome. We're about the stars of heart and air. And we're, going to go, we're not going to go through that time period. Some of you have got that written in your margin. So in your margins, um, what is this time period of about the space of Parthenon? What have you written there? How many years? Sorry. 14 years. The tricky bit is it's about the space of Parthenon. So it's 14 years, and, and we're not going to go through how do you get that, because I'm up to you, we might. 14 years, about the space of Parthenon. It is the time from when Constantine has now taken the world. AD 324. 14 years later, it is AD 337. The Constantine dies and there's chaos. There's no more silence. So when you read that verse, verse 1 of chapter 8, Constantine's coming, the seventh seal is open, everything is tranquil politically, socially, and then 14 years later, we'll just turn over the page just so that we do see the connection. We turn the page over and we pick up the record in verse 5. And the angel, chapter 8, verse 5, and the angel took the censer, filled it with the fire of the altar, cast it into the earth, and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings. Full stop. We don't read the next bit, because the next bit is years later. There were voices and thunderings and lightnings. AD 337. Constantine is dead. The 14 years of silence in heaven is now past. It's 337 AD. Now, just if you haven't got this note in your margins, the next little bit of that last verse, and then there was an earthquake. That's AD 361. That's years down the track when Constantine's met you, Julian says, what's going on? This Christian empire? There are chaos all over the place. There are bishops in Alexandria. There are bishops in Nicodemia. There are bishops in Constantinople. There are bishops in Rome, all at each other's throat. Is Jesus God? Is Jesus a man? It's chaos. Constantine's sons are trying to divide up, the, up the, the Roman world. It was chaos. Lightnings and thunders and voices after the death of Constantine. And so in AD 361, an earthquake happens, Julian, Constantine's nephew says, well, if this is Christianity, it's out. For two years, he came in and brought back pagans. Okay. So in, in Revelation 8 and verse 1, we have a fulfillment of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The pagan Roman world would suppress the apostasy. It wouldn't allow the apostasy to develop until pagan Rome was removed and then the development of the apostasy. 
Oh, and having said that, brothers and sisters, and having said that, and people, having said that, moving through these six seals, we get to the fulfillment of that first thing. And here are our six or our first four seals. And we're going to just now very briefly look at the way in which they spill into a cry that goes up to God in the big seal. So as we start the first seal, we read of the white horse, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And the objective of the first seal was to weaken and weaken and weaken and weaken the pagan reigning world. And to finally, the great earthquake, and it's rolled away in the sixth seal like a scroll. But as this pagan Roman world, I mean, 84 years of peace, 31 years of civil war, 24 years of terrible injustice, and 68 years of death. And you get to this fourth seal of the pagan Roman empires like an old shuffly horse, a skinny breath, hardly able to move, and God is weakening and weakening, ready for the apostasy to come into play. But in all the way through this, brothers and sisters and young people, we get to the fifth seal and a cry goes up. A cry goes up by our brothers and sisters. And they cry, having, having gone through all of these years of, of, of awfulness in the Roman pagan world, the cry goes on, and our brothers and sisters cry with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, is thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth, the pagan world? But you know, our brothers and sisters call God a despot. In a fancy calling God a despot. How long, O oh, despotic, that this is the only time in the book of Revelation where the word despot is used. And here are the brothers and sisters calling God a despot. Why? Why would they refer to God as despotic in this context? Well, the reason, brothers and sisters, is because there was a despot ruling from Rome. And he was Diocletian. And he was the greatest Roman emperor to sit upon the throne since Octavian Augustus, the emperor at the birth of Christ. And this Diocletian was a despot. <coughs> All Roman emperors before him, they wore the Lorette. They wore the coronal wreath, not him. He wore a diadem. And when, Di and when Diocletian moved around his, his palace, he moved around with long flowing robes. And when he walked around with his diadem and his long flowing robes, he walked around like he was gliding on ice. And people would go, is he Roman? He looks more like a cheeky. And he wanted to send that, that idea out to others. He, brothers and sisters, was not going to allow any thug with a sword to take his empire. He was not going to allow any rich man to come along, as it had done in the past, and open up his wallet and say, well, I've got plenty of money, I think I'll buy the emperorship. No. He wasn't going to allow any crowd or mob to store his palace, and so he turned his palace into a city. And if you gained audience to this man, Unlike in previous times where you approached an emperor, you would go down on your knee, you would put your hand on your chest, you would look and stare the emperor in the eye, you would stand up, you would take a step back, and that's how you would dress, not this man. If you gained audience with this man, you had to lay flat on your face, which I'll not demonstrate. You will lay flat on your face three times. And then when you stood up, you were not allowed to look him in the eye. He was a despot. And therefore the hubbub and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the murmuring in the marketplaces and in the stalls of this particular empire, they were coming. Who is the true despot? The Lord God only and true or Diocletian unholy and unsure? And our brothers and sisters were crying to God in the face of this man and saying to God, you only are our true despot. Despite the power and the influence of this man, we will not give our hearts to him, although he demands it. We are going to give our hearts to you and only you in the face of terrible persecution. 
That's why, brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters cry to God, how long does this have to go on? And God would say to our brothers and sisters, you don't have to wait long. There's coming a time when men like that will be eradicated from this world. And that came in the first great earth. That came in with the removal of pagan right. So brothers and sisters, this sets the scene up to the content of Revelation as well. It's what Diocletian did in the fourth seal. He was the last emperor of the fourth seal. He was the first emperor of the fifth seal. What Diocletian did in the fourth seal, the pale wolves, he divided the empire into a tetrarchy, into a rule of four. So you have an Augusti in the West, and you have an Augusti in the East. And then you had a Junior Caesar. And there we have. We have the Augusti in the West, Maximian, and Constantius and Junior Caesar. Constantius being the father of Constantine. And you have Diocletian, the Augusti in the East, and Galerius. He's understudy the junior seat, a rule of law. What happened? And I'm just setting the scene here now to bring us into Revelation 12, bridging the gap from the fourth seal, the fifth seal is our bats right now. How long? How long is this going to go on for? I'm bridging the gap between the fourth and the fifth seal into the sixth seal or Revelation 12. Four emperors, two Augusti. To Julius Caesar, set up by that man, the ruler of all the Tetrarchy. Well, what happened, brothers and sisters, is that Diocletian advocated from the throne. He got ill and he stepped down. Even though he was ill and he stepped down and he was still pulling the strings of the puppets beneath him, he was still in the background with some evil But you now had Galerius take the role of the, of the Augusta. Then we had his servant come on the scene, Maxentius who ruled in Rome, promising the Christians all of these lovely goodies, and it wheeled his way into Rome. And then we have another person come on the scene, Lysidius, the brother-in-law to Constantine. And then we had another person come on the scene, a cruel pagan who hated a Christian with a passion, Maximian. We're not going to go through all this history, but I just want to show you. One, two, three, four, Five, six. We need three because Revelation 12 demands it. Three. Because in Revelation 12, the pagan dragon with his tail draws the third part of the stars of heaven. We need three. And so, what happened, brothers and sisters? It is this. This forecast I have experienced. And Constantius now becomes the Augusta. One, two, three, four, five. We need two more to go. Okay. So, one, two, three, four, five. We need more to go. We need three. And Revelation 4 demands it. So, brothers and sisters, Constantius dies, and Constantine, now elected by his men in a fervor of enthusiasm over there in England. This man is not very handy. Galerius is a pagan through and through. He does not like Constantine. He is determined to kill Constantine. How dare you, you over there in England, elect this man? I'm in charge, says Galerius, and therefore he was very agitated. Well, brothers and sisters, we've got one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five still. So what happens now is that Constantine is about to move down into Rome. But before he does, in 312, Galerius dies in 300 and a leper. Now we've got four. Constantine now sweeps down from York in England, and as he comes down, brothers and sisters, it's happening with my little point here, but now I can't get my left and right. So Constantine comes down into, well, just outside of Rome, at the Milvian Bridge, and in 312, Constantine beats. Maxentius, the pagan emperor, and now brothers and sisters, we have three. 
Constantine, Licinius, and Maximin. And Constantine, would at Middleby and Bridge, as many of you would know, supposedly has a vision, and the vision that he has, a cross superimposed upon the sun. And he hears a voice, and the voice says, in this sign, conquer. Now, what did he see? What did he put on the shields of his men? Well, what he did, brothers and sisters, is there you have the Greek word for Christ. And the two first letters of the Greek word for Christ are the letters chi rho, X, P. And so Constantine had that symbol, the first two letters of the name Christ, planted on the shields of his men. And with that, he marched into Rome and defeated Maxentius. And now, brothers and sisters, this man Constantine, the man child, of Revelation 12 is politically born. Because in Revelation 12, it says the dragon stood there about to devour the child as soon as it was born. Constantine is politically born in 312. He is now the emperor of the West, having marched with that symbol, the Lavera, the XP, the Chi Rome. Now the scene is set, brothers and sisters, for Revelation 12. And the detail of the sixth scene, the detail of the first great earthquake of the apocalypse. And it's tailed through the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. His tail. Well, it's not Constantine's tail because he's not pagan. It's either Licinius, Constantine's brother-in-law, or it's Maximin. So how did it look? How did it pan out, brothers and sisters? Our brothers and sisters in the fifth seal cried, How long, O despotes, holy and true, didst thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell upon the earth? God says, you don't have to wait long. I'm going to roll this pagan Roman word and cast it away. And so, brothers and sisters, we move now into the sixth seal and connecting verses the last six verses of chapter six with revelation chapter 12. now just 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 as a little stepping stone into chapter 12 you would be aware of this that this earthquake is a political earthquake but of course yes. Yes. some of you will have these two quotations in your margin if some of the young ones don't it's a very good two quotations to write next to this, which show us that the earth and the heavens are respectively or is having reference to people, the earth, and of course, rules the heavens. So we won't go back to those two quotations, but what I want to do is this. Sometimes people read this, this section of Revelation chapter six and go, oh, this must be talking about Israel. It's talking about a fig tree. This has got to be something to do with Israel. Oh, maybe the holy city is Israel. Maybe the beast is Israel. No. But it's talking with symbolic. It, it, it can't be Gentile powers. Well, you might like to make a note of this, brothers and sisters. And that is this quotation. We won't turn it up. But if you go to Isaiah 34, verses 4 through 5, you see the same language used in Isaiah 34, verses 4. And it's it's talking in the context of a heaven departing as a scroll and in the context of a fig tree. And it's not about Israel. It's about Edom. So that's a very good quotation to show that we are not in the context of Israel, but legitimately in the context of a Gentile nation. So you might want to jot that down and have a look at that in your leisure. All right, brothers and sisters. This chapter 12 is the first of the three great earthquakes of the apocalypse. I think all of us in the room would know where the three great earthquakes are. End of chapter 6, end of chapter 11, end of chapter 16. The three great earthquakes. What we do need to make sure of is this. We already referred to Revelation. Revelation 8 and verse 5, 
when there were voices and thunderings and lightnings, AD 337, when Constantine died, and then in AD 361, there was an earthquake, a little earthquake, a two-year removal of Christianity and the incoming of paganism. So this little earthquake here is not number three. Brethren and sisters, young people, just also note Revelation 11, verse 19. Let's just turn that up very quickly. Make sure that we cover that. So if some of the younger ones or the younger ones in the truth are looking at so the three great earthquakes, yep, chapter 6, chapter 11, chapter 16. What about this one in, uh, in Revelation 11 and toward the end of the chapter? Now, just in passing, verse 13, chapter 11, we did this at the Bible school. Verse 13, same hour there was a great earthquake. This is the second great earthquake of the apocalypse. This is the French Revolution. Just put that to one side. Now have a look at verse 19 of Revelation 11. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Now, some of you will have in your margin, this is exactly the same earthquake as in Revelation 16. This is the earthquake between Armageddon and the beginning of the millennium. So this one, although it doesn't say a great earthquake, it certainly says great hail, which is the language of Revelation 16. So just, just a little note, in case we trip over that when we're doing our readings. That earthquake at the end of chapter 11 is the third great earthquake referred to in chapter 16. All right. Who didn't have that in their margin to start? Well, good. That's excellent. So, let's start somewhere, don't we? All right. Okay, brother and sister. Skip through this, skip through this. Tom is the enemy, right? Linking the last six verses of chapter six, the first great earthquake, to chapter 12. They are hand in glove. They are talking about the same event. Let's have a little bit of chart here to show you the similarity of language. In chapter 6, we have in verse 12 a great earthquake. The correlation or the parallel to that is in Revelation 12 in verse 7. Pagans have been cast out. Michael, he who like God, Constantine. So there is the that there is the comparison, there is the same event that's taking place. We have the language in verse 13 of chapter 6. The stars of heaven fell to the earth. The pagan Roman administration was demolished. But in verse 4 of chapter 12, the dragon draws the third part of the stars of heaven. You have similar language. In Revelation 6 and verse 12, you have the sun blackened and the moon turned to blood. In verse 1 of chapter 12, ah, the sun's back, not black, it's back. The moon is not blood anymore, it is now brightly burning under the feet of this woman. So here's a woman now clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. And then in Revelation 6, you have these people running around saying, oh, fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. These are the pagans running away from Constantine and his army. And in Revelation 4, yet another group saying, oh, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. So you can see we have a legitimacy in drawing the last six verses of chapter 6 into Revelation and chapter 12. All right, brothers and sisters, Revelation 12, and I know you won't see that text at this stage, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to highlight some colours. The hub of this chapter, war in the political heavens, war for Rome. There was war in heaven. It wasn't just one war. This went on year after year after year. This went on, brothers and sisters, from AD 312 to AD 324. Revelation 8, verse 1. And it says there that Michael, Constantine, and his army fought against Licinius, his brother-in-law. Licinius is the, is the major character, 
the major antagonist in this against Constantine. So Constantine and his brother-in-law are there featured in this verse. Constantine and Licinius fought it out year after year. And then finally, Licinius, the pagan dragon, was cast out that old suit. Now, brothers and sisters, just so we understand the content of this chapter, it's imperative that we understand the two dragons. When you're reading through this, if you don't have this coloured in, there's a pagan dragon and there's a Christian dragon. We can do the same thing with the women. You've got to colour in three different women. Otherwise, you get all confusion. And where am I here? Who's this? Who's... So now, there are the colours of the pagan dragon. So there you go. If you were to colour that in, just give you a minute for those of you who are... Was well, that gone off the screen, has it? Oh, OK. I'll just leave that there. But now, if you want to enter into that little colouring exercise now, please do. So just give you a couple of seconds for those who would like to colour that in. Because in a moment, we're going to flick over and see a Christian dragon. We'll colour that in a different colour. And that helps to allow this chapter to open up. You can copy these slides if you want to. If anyone would like a copy of all these, we certainly can make them available. So what I'll do, brothers and sisters, I will just flick this up here and just allow you, if you so desire, to cover the rest of it. So we have, I think most of us have kind of got that down there. Let's now just, 17 little cover the squares in there, you've got the abide amount. The great red dragon. Now we're gonna finish our study on this note. That up. There is the Christian dragon. The dragon has changed from pagan to Christian. Constantine now is a adversary against the brothers and sisters. So he's the man child. He's the Michael. He's the serpent in verse 14. The serpent in verse 15. He's the dragon in verse 16 and 17. Is there one down the bottom here? No. So I'll leave that there and I'll just get you to colour those in. Now you've got clearly delineated in this chapter the two dragons. One disappears and a Christian dragon comes in on the scene. How do we prove this is right? We have a dragon with seven heads and ten horns. Where would I go to prove that this is right? Somebody says to you, ah, oh, Rome, come on, Michael, come no way. How can I prove this is right? Where would I go? How about Revelation 17? We'll finish on this note. Revelation 17. We've got seven heads and ten horns. So we go to Revelation 17. And we pick up the verse in verse 9. Some of you, this is old territory. But I wonder whether we'll be able to explain this. Now, brothers and sisters, I just got your attention right now. You've just turned up to Revelation 17 and verse 9. We're going to say something here. This is what I want you to grasp. The seven heads are seven forms of government. By the fallen, one is, one is yet to come. When he comes, he must continue a short space. The one that was and is not, even he is the eight, and is of the seven, and goeth into petition. I want us to clearly understand that before we leave today. By the fall of one is one is yet to come. When he comes, he must continue a short space. The one that was and is not even his, the eight and the seven, and go into petition. Look how easy this is. It's not a quadratic equation. Look how easy this is. Well, the first thing we see to prove this is Rome is the geographic location. Well, this is easy. This is the simple bit. The woman that thou sawest is one sits among seven hills. The seven hills are seven mountains upon which the woman sits. Now we've seen this coin, Roma, and there's a woman sitting among seven hills or seven mountains. But, but Rome's not the only city that sits among seven hills. So that's not enough proof for me. This brother's existence is amazing. Verse 10, there are seven forms of government. This is the political identification of this beast, this seven-headed beast. And then we read, 
in these verses, John, seven forms of government. Well, to let you know who this monster is with the seven heads. Seven forms of government. Five are fallen. And five forms of government had been in existence prior to AD 96. And those five forms of government were regal, consular, dictatorial, disembowel, tribunitian. 700 years BC, Rome was ruled over by a king. 500 BC, Rome became a republic. And they were ruled over by two consuls. Yes, they had the Senate. People could speak through the Senate on the matters of legislation. But they had two consuls ruling as Rome was a republic. But every now and then they had social upheaval. They had conflict between two classes of people. And every now and then, Rome had to bring in a dictator to sort out internal squabbles or issues on the border. So Rome had a dictatorial form of government. Or there was still some chaos going on in Rome. And so they said, let's go across to Greece. Find out how they did. So they brought back 10 wars, the rule of 10, Desi, Desi Byron. Still in their turmoils, and some people said, no, we want to have a better form of government. So, so the plebeian class of people pushed their tribunes and tribunitial form of government. Five forms of government had existed. John, one form of government is, when John was there in 1896, the imperial empress ruled in Rome. And then John, the other one is yet to come. The Goths came in and ruled in Rome. Goths, barbarians, but they loved the Roman ways. So in came the Goths and they ruled in Rome, dressed up in all the Roman regalia, even said to the emperor over in Constantinople, we love Rome, don't kick us out, we'll do what you want us to do. So the Goths ruled in Rome for 60 years. When he comes, the seventh head, he's going to continue a short state for 60 years. Now that's the easy bit. John, seven heads, seven forms of government. By the fallen, one is imperial, one is yet to come. When he comes, he must continue a short space. How are your heads so far? You with us? Okay, that's the easy bit. This is the tricky bit. The one that was and is not, either is the eighth, and of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Now, have a look at this one. <laughs> How easy this is. By the fallen, one is, that's where John is. The other is not yet come. The seventh head is not yet come. When the Goths do come, they'll only continue for 16 years. Okay. By the fallen, one is, one is yet to come. John, go over there and stand there in the future with the Goths. Now, John, look back. John's here. The one that was, was John here. The one that was and is not, is not, because he's here. Even he is the eight and is one of the sin. Simple as that. And if you want a lovely cross reference, well, it's existence, just turn up to Revelation 13 and verse 3. The one that was and is not, because John's looking back, there's a resurrection, there's a reemergence of the imperial head coming after the gods, way, way after the gods, not straight away. Revelation 13 and verse 3. And I saw one of his heads, the sixth head, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and he became the eighth. Right there, Revelation 13 and verse 3. What an amazing book this is. Yes, it's history. Yes, it requires a little bit of math to work it out. But what an astounding thing. So brothers and sisters, we are then in our next study, we wrap this one up now, in our next study, we're going to put our both feet in Revelation chapter 12, walk through the rest of Revelation 12 and see this amazing drama as it unfolds, as this war goes on between Constantine and his brother-in-law, and we see these women involved in this chapter amazingly the way in which God, our God in heaven, places this on record to thrill you and me, to prove to you and me unequivocally that this is, in fact, the Word of God. Thank you.
As we said in our first study, we're going now to put both feet in this chapter and walk through, having very quickly identified the two dragons, we're going to provide evidence that this is in fact how this should be interpreted, that the pagan dragon then merges into the Christian dragon, and we're going to see how, why, um, and when this happened, and also having a look at these three women and how they appear in this chapter. Now, we, we made the point in our study previously that the scene is set for the pagan dragon, whoever it is, whether it's Lysenius or Maximin, to draw the third part of the stars of heaven. We now have three emperors in place, three-thirds of the pagan Roman Empire. And so we did look at those pagan dragons there, and you coloured in, of course, the blue there, some of you did. Someone mentioned to me, can we have a copy of the slide so that we can do this little activity? And the answer is absolutely. If anyone's got a USB, well, you don't need USBs anymore. Go through Brother Gordon and he will give you all of these slides if you so desire. Now, brothers and sisters, young people, we have here in Revelation chapter 12, the beginning of the story, the beginning of the drama, and we have here, reading in verse Five, these words, and she brought forth a man child. And of course, in verse seven, we know oh so well, this is Michael, he who like God. He's a man child, but he's her child, as we would know. And he was born, as we said before, in 312 AD. While Constantine is streaming down from York in England, Coming down to beat Maxentius because he knew if he didn't get Maxentius, Maxentius would have gotten him. So as Constantine is streaming down from York and England to take on Maxentius, he is in the womb of his mother. And when he's born politically in 312, like all newborn babies, he does not yet know who his mother is. So he looks around and he says, a year goes by and there's all these different sects all buying and jostling for his support. Pick me, pick me. And one year goes by, two years go by, three years go by. And at 83, 12, 13, 14, 15, he goes, you, the Catholic sect, you I will adorn with the sun. You I will put the moon under your feet and make you the universal religion. You have victory over the pagan Roman world with the 12 stars. So in 315, he now finds out who his mum is. Born in 312, lines himself with his mother in 315. So, brothers and sisters, we then read that this is Michael in verse 7. And, of course, in the Greek, we know, many of us, it is he who is like God. But in the Greek, it is not Michael, it is ho Michael. In the Greek, it is the Michael. It's the he who like God for this situation. And he would be a type of Christ. <clears throat> because brothers and sisters, the he who like God for this situation, just like God raised up people, he raised up him for this situation. God raised up Nebuchadnezzar. God raised up Cyrus. God raised up Alexander. God raised up Napoleon. Now God raises up this man. A type of Christ? He's going to remove the dragon, and so will Christ in Revelation 20. He's going to rule the world with a rod of iron, this Michael, and so will Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ has ruled the world with a rod of iron and cast out the dragon or bound the dragon, there will be peace in the world through the kingdom. Just like we read in Revelation 8 and verse 1, there was silence. Dragon cast out, Michael ruling the world with a rod of iron, silence and peace. Very typical of the greater he who, like God, who is yet to come. He is the Michael, God raised up for this situation. And then you read this verse here, brothers and sisters. You read this verse here in verse 5. And she, 
brought forth a man child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. What does that mean? This child, this Michael, was caught up to God and to his throne. Well, brothers and sisters and young people, this idea of being caught up in the Greek means to be lifted up forcibly. That's as it in the Greek. And therefore, the battles of force by Constantine's army allowed the inevitable lifting up to God. Oh, this is a this is a very, very apt and appropriate quotation in this context, is it not? Come with me, if you will, to Romans and chapter 13. Lifted up to God, forcibly lifted up to the wars that he would engage in. Well, how appropriate is this quotation in Romans and chapter 13? And verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. That was God's throne. He ordained that and lifted this man up to his throne. His power ordained by him. So that's the way in which this is used. Lifted up forcibly by God. And as we read that verse there, he was caught up unto God to God's throne. All thrones are God's. And this one was, in fact, also God's throne. So, brothers and sisters, we then come to this verse here. Now, this is where it starts to become a little challenging. We come to this verse here and we read, now look at this. This is verse 4. And, and, and we're looking at the latter end, the second part of verse 4. <laughs> then we're going to go back and we're going to look at the first part of verse 4. So what you've got here is you've got the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered or to devour her child as soon as it was born. We made the point that Constantine was born in 312. Now you could legitimately put these emperors in front of that verse and Galerius the dragon stood before the woman. In 311, Galerius was absolutely incensed that Constantine should be given the supremacy of an, of an emperor. No, I don't want a Christian, Constantine being pro-Christian. No. And so Galerius was to, to, to determined to hunt him down and to kill him. He was the dragon ready to devour the child as soon as the opportunity arose. Likewise, Maxentius. When Constantine came down to Milvian Bridge, 14 Ks, 14 kilometers outside of Rome, Maxentius was determined to slay this man child before, in this instance, he was born. And then it swings the drama to the final of these characters in this particular play. This is Lysidius. Lysidius, after Constantine was born, now takes the major stage. Lysidius, the dragon, is going to stand before the woman and devour him as soon as he is born. So, brothers and sisters, his tale, there is a third part of the stars of heaven. We have three emperors, as we've been saying as we've been walking through. Now, there is the empire divided into three sections. Constantine has been born. He now is ruler of the West. There are two pagan emperors in the East. Lysidius, Constantine's brother-in-law, oh, he flip-flopped. Ah, oh, Christian, ah, oh, pagan, ah, oh, Christian, pagan. And in the end, he became pagan through and through. And Lysidius looked across there with his pagan lustful eyes and said, you know, I wouldn't mind that. And then he looks across here to the east and goes, hmm, I wouldn't mind that either. So constant, so Lysidius looks to this one third and says, I think I'll take that. I think I'll use my great tail and I'll grab my pagan tail and I'll cast the stars to the earth. Well, Maximin provoked him. 
Maximin provoked Licinius to war, but Maximin died in the process, and in came Licinius and drew one third of the stars of heaven, the Roman heaven, and cast them to the earth. How are we going there with that screen? Is that really, really, really super bright with the sun shining? Is it all good to you? I am totally and absolutely astounded. Sun is shining through the window. <laughs> I, I almost jumped off the platform, ran over to the window. I really did need to do that. Have a look outside and see that the sun is shining. Really not. So, brothers and sisters, here is Lysenius. He's now drawn one third of the stars and passed them to the earth. Now, that, that is a, a fulfillment of that verse. But there's another fulfillment of that little expression, he drew the third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. It's kind of what got two fulfillments in this chapter. That's one of them. Okay? Now, the battle lines are drawn. Licinius commands these two thirds. Constantine won. So the battle lines are drawn. We now have two combatants in this chapter. We have Constantine and we have Lysidius. Now, brothers and sisters, this now would be battle after battle until AD 324, Revelation 8, verse 1, until there would be silence in heaven for about the space of nothing. Now, this is the great earthquake of Revelation 6, the first of those three great earthquakes. I want you to note this. Two combatants. I want you to note verse 8 and 9 and verse 12, 13. This gets a bit tricky. Just try and see if we can get our head around this. Licinius has drawn one third, beaten Maximin. Licinius the pagan. Now look at verse 8 and 9 of Revelation 12. Or verse 7 for context. There was war in heaven. Constantine and his army fought against Licinius and his army. And verse 8, and prevail, prevailed not, did Licinius. Neither was there place found any more in the Roman heavens. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Brothers and sisters and young people, he was cast out, but he wasn't obliterated. Because when you read verse 12 and 13, you read in verse 12, Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the dragon or the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he hath but a short time. And then you read verse 13, and when Licinius saw that he was cast down to the earth, what did he do? He persecuted the woman. He's still running around. He's been dealt with, but he's still running around doing some nasty things. What happened, brothers and sisters, was this. War after war after war with Constantine and Licinius, in the end, Constantine said, listen, behave yourself. I'm going to allocate you, Lysidius, one third of the empire. Get over there and behave yourself. Well, Lysidius was over there in this one third, the area that Maximin had previously occupied. And here's Lysidius knowing he's got a short time left. He's getting very upset. And what he's doing is now going to thrash his great big pagan tail and do something here now. Having already cleared out Maximin with that one thing, now he's going to do something else. He knows he's got a short time and he's going to persecute the woman. And he's in a section here and there's all these Christians, there's these churches. And so he runs around looting the churches, getting this wealth, getting this wealth, and he's drumming up another army, a great army, to go and have a final battle with Constantine. And he's thrashing around there, knowing in that verse he has but a short time, and now he's going to persecute the woman by looting the churches, getting the money. And now, brothers and sisters and young people, he's ready to go to war. So twice he thrashed his tail. Once he got rid of Maximin. Secondly, he's knocking off the Christians inside that area and getting rid of them. Now he's got the money, and this is what we read. 
He gets his men together and he says to them, friends and fellow warriors, says Licinius, assemble with all these pagan gods. These are the gods of our ancestors whom received from our earliest predecessors of objects of worship. We honour them. But, says Licinius, he who commands the army, that is my brother-in-law Constantine, that is drawn up against us, having adopted an atheistic opinion, he calls his brother an atheist. He says, my brother is an atheist. He's adopted an atheistic opinion. My brother-in-law violates the customs of the fathers. My brother-in-law, Constantine, venerates a god from abroad. I know not whence. And my brother-in-law, Constantine, disgraces his troops with his ignominious standard, the high Rome, trusting in which he arms not so much against us as against the gods whom he offends. So Licinius says, if the foreign god whom we now deride should appear the mightiest, we must acknowledge and honour him and bid farewell to these to whom we have vainly lit candles, waxed tapers. And so off he goes to war. And he's beaten by Constantine. <laughs> and their brothers and sisters is a coin. And there is that ignominious standard that most Licinius spoke about, the Cairo. And there is a serpent under the foot of Constantine, and there is Constantine's name. And Constantine, in his letter to Eusebius, look at the words. That dragon, Constantine said, how do you think our brother and sisters did? Our brother and sisters were living here, living in this environment. And our brethren and sisters who live prior to this AD 324, read this letter and their hearts would have raced with enthusiasm, seeing the fulfillment of Bible prophecy in Revelation 12. We look way, way back and go, a bunch of Roman history. They were thrilled at Bible prophecy. That dragon, said Constantine, having been disposed from the governance and affairs by God's providence, but now, <laughs> pardon me, but now that liberty had a flush. <clears throat> right. But now that liberty is restored and that dragon <clears throat> driven from the administration of public affairs by <clears throat> the providence of the supreme deity, oh, and by the way, this is Constantine and our instrumentality, we trust that all can see the efficacy of the divine power written by Constantine. Plucked straight out of Revelation 12. Well, brothers and sisters, look at this. <clears throat> Here's a verse in, in verse 10. Now, young people, <clears throat> don't stumble over this one. Hang on, let me just throw that over there. Let me just open this up or you have a little mental break. Okay? Don't often do this. I don't know, I'll, I'll, I'll often open up lollies in front of an audience. But you're English and you'll understand the need for us colonialists. colonialists. All right, brothers and sisters, look at this. In Revelation 12 and verse 10, Constantine beat the dragon. Now, let's read verse 10 together of Revelation chapter 12. And I heard a loud voice saying, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. These brothers and sisters are the Catholics. These are those that went to war with Constantine. These are the Laodicean Christadelphians as Brother Thomas refers to them in Eureka. These are saying the kingdom of God is on earth. So along with this victory over paganism came the error in doctrine, thinking God's kingdom was there. We don't believe that. Look at this, brothers and sisters. Lactanius wrote this. Let us celebrate the triumph of God with gladness. 
Let us commemorate God's victory with praise. Let us make mention in our prayers day and night of the peace which after 10 years of persecution he has conferred upon his people. What an astounding thing that we can look back and see those events fulfilled. Absolutely accurate. Well, brothers and sisters, now, Constantine, the mother whom he discovered some three years later. Now, look at this. We mentioned earlier on that there are two dragons in this chapter, the pagan dragon and the Christian dragon. Look at historically how we justify the, the morphing from a pagan accuser of our brethren and sisters to a Christian accuser. Have a look at this abridged comment from Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. He says this, The Edict of Milan, 313 AD, when Constantine, after beating Maxentius at Milvian Bridge, he got together with his brother-in-law in 313 and they drafted up a charter of toleration, religious freedom. The Edict of Milan, the great charter of toleration, has confirmed to each individual of the Roman world the privilege of choosing and professing his own religion. But this inestimable privilege was soon violated with the knowledge of Truth. So get to, so given calls Constantine's religion, placing the moon under this woman's head, truth. So with the knowledge of truth, the Emperor Constantine imbibed the maxims of persecution. He became the dragon. And the sects which descended from the Catholic Church were afflicted and oppressed by the triumph. Of the apostate woman, my mother, Constantine finally discovered. I will clothe you with the sun and put the moon under your feet. What an amazing thing, brothers and sisters. And so, this apostate religion, this these maxims of persecution were about to be inflicted on anyone who dissented from the now universal church. Well, here they are. Here are the dissenters from the universal church, and they would be the two other women in this chapter. So here we got, what we have with the two dragons, here we've now got in Revelation 12, the truth gone bad. So Revelation 12, dear brothers and sisters, we've now got a woman. So you've got three women in this chapter. So if you want to get out your little colouring in pamphlets if you so desire, and colour these in, this is the Catholic, this is the truth gone bad. So for those that don't want to do the little activity, you can just have a little mental break. All good for that? The one down there, verses 1 and 2. And we come to here, and we have verse 4 and verse 5. Three women. It's important that we know who they are. So, pardon me, so verses 4 through 5, and the final one is that one tucked up there, verse 13. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Nine little colours in there to identify the Catholic woman. Well, there was now a religious community that turned around and said, what have we to do with politics? What have we to do with the courts of Constantine? This is not what Christ said we should engage in. We are not having anything to do with this new state politically involved religion called Catholicism. And therefore, flip through there, flip through there, flip through there, and therefore we have a woman running away. This woman that now runs away, she's not really running away. She is another religious group 
who say we'll have nothing to do with the way in which this structure has set up, is set up. And Constantine said to these heretics, shape up or ship out. And when it says there that the woman fled into the wilderness, what it really means, brothers and sisters and young people, is this religious protesting woman was placed in a wilderness state. She was exiled from the new universal religion. Constantine said, you are cut off from society. You will have no access to anything. She was placed in a wilderness state as she stood up protesting against this apostate woman. And so she runs away. She's given two wings of the great eagle. She's given the extremities of the empire to be nourished and to flee. Now, you know, brothers and sisters, the third one is there. So we've got Protestants, if you want. And here, the dragon was wrought with this Protestant woman and went and made war with not only this woman, but the remnant of her seed. Now, I want you to note this verse because this does show us the differentiation between the Protestant religious group and mixed up with them were our brothers and sisters. Whom, as far as Constantine was concerned, they were all just heretics. But the, but the Christian audience were heretics of the heretics. Now, come with me, if you will, to Revelation 2 and verse 24. The same Greek word, this Greek word here, remnant, is used eight times in the Apocalypse. Eight, eight times. This is the first time it's used. Look at the context. Revelation 2 and verse 24. <laughs> This is the Ecclesia of Thyatira. And we read in verse 24 of Revelation 2 these words. But unto you I say, and unto, now here's the word, the rest, this is the first time that word is used in the Apocalypse, the rest, the remnant of her seed, other brothers and sisters. So unto you I say, in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, it's where we are in chapter 12. It's a matter of doctrine, brothers and sisters. And have not known the depths of Satan. This is a Christian Satan that we're dealing with, a Christian adversary in Constantine. Or well, cast your eye out to verse 20 of chapter 2. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman. What are the context of three women in chapter 12? Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants, listen to this, to commit fornication. This Catholic woman is pregnant. She has committed spiritual fornication. So the first time that word is used, all those words flow out, contextualising it into Revelation Chapter 12. So we have three women, brothers and sisters. And so this woman, this woman, this protesting woman, among whom were our brothers and sisters, as another woman, fled or placed in a wilderness state. And they would remain so, witnessing against Roman Catholicism for 1,260 years. You had 312. 1,260 years, and we're not going into this chapter. We did this at the Bible school. 1572, Revelation 11 and verse 3. So if you want to put a cross-reference there, when this woman would cease witnessing and begin to be killed, your cross-reference is from Revelation 12 verse 14 into Revelation 11 and verse 3. That's all we can say about that at this moment. She fled. She was placed into a wilderness state. And we read now, brothers and sisters, as we pull our study to a conclusion almost, verse 14, Revelation 12. And to this woman were given two wings of the great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for 1,260 years. An interesting little expression locking us back to Daniel. 
fleeing from the face of Constantine in the first instance, his sons thereafter, and then thereafter the Catholic emperors in Constantinople. You know, brothers and sisters, she's given these two wings. You haven't got this cross-reference. Of course, you know Deuteronomy 28 and verse 49. Rome, as swift as the eagle flieth, Deuteronomy 28, verse 49. Mm -hmm. You know Matthew 24, where the carcass is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. You know Matthew 24, the carcass is the rotting, polluting commonwealth of Judah. And in Matthew 24, the eagles are the Roman army, the lightning out of the east under Titus as they took Jerusalem. So there's two excellent quotations to show to us we're talking about the Roman Empire, the two wings of the great eagle. And there, through history, were those protesting, mm -hmm. the, that protesting woman against Rome. In the first instance, with Constantine, the woman that was placed into a wilderness state in 312, 13, 14, 15, and thereafter, were the Donatists of North Africa. Now, look at this as we finish. What an amazing thing in the Bible is. How much detail do we need to tremble at this book? Honestly, brothers and sisters. Coming back to Revelation 12 and verse 15. We read this. Here's a protesting woman, the Donatists in the first instance, religious, protesting against Constantine, placed into a wilderness state. Now look at verse 15 of chapter 12. And the serpent, Constantine, the Christian dragon, cast out of his mouth water as a flood, judgment. And we know that's judgment because Isaiah 8 and verse 7 and Jeremiah 46, verse 7 through 8. Judgment, the word flood, the idea of a flood is judgment. So Constantine is going to judge this protesting woman, among whom are our brothers and sisters, to carry the woman away. And he sends the flood that she might be carried away of the flood. But you then read in verse 16 of Revelation 12, but the earth opened its mouth to swallow the flood. So there's a big opening in the ground. The earth opened its mouth to take away this, this effect of persecution on the Christian woman, the protesting woman, the Protestants, if you will. Who's the earth? If the Donatists are in North Africa, in the first instance of those who were the first brothers and sisters, the Donatists were the first Christian group to stand against the state church, the first in history to stand against the state church. So here are the Donatists. They're being persecuted by this serpent, Constantine. But an earth helps the woman. Who's the earth? Anyone know? Who's the earth? What, what does this mean? Well, these brothers and sisters were the circumcellions of North Africa. These were a bunch of blokes out there in North Africa that were kind of like religious, but really way out there. They were so extreme. Here are the Donatists, very happy to work alongside kind of this group called the circumcellion. The idea means to roam around, to circle, to circumvent, to circumnavigate. You've got these... These, these intense political group with a bit of religion who hate Rome and they will not be shackled to Rome and they're walking around killing Catholics. Ah, oh, but they read in the Bible, did these circumcellions. He that lives by the sword shall die by the sword. So instead of carrying a sword, they used to carry clubs and they used to call these clubs Israelites. So they're walking around carrying these Israelites and killing Catholics. And they were so intense in there, they were like, they were like terrorists. And they wanted to go out and be martyred. They, they, they brought up, bring it on, I'm going to, and I want to die. Remind you of terrorists and extremists today? They had them back then. So the earth, God provided a buffer 
in order that these protesting religious witnesses, including our brothers and sisters, would not be exterminated from the earth. What an amazing thing, brothers and sisters. Now, we finish our study right now after we read this. Here is a fourth century apocalypse student, a donatist, one of the ones that were fled, put into a wilderness state. Look at this makes me, this gives me goosebumps. How do you reckon our brothers and sisters who were looking forward in prophetic, in the prophetic terms to the fulfillment of Revelation 12? Suddenly, behold, suddenly, said this Donatus, the polluted flood of the Macarian persecution burst forth from the tyrannical church of Constantine's son, King Constance. And two beasts, two men, being sent to Africa from thence to wit, Macarius and Paulus, a most horrible and cruel ecclesiastical war was proclaimed that a Christian people like the Donatists should be compelled by naked swords of soldiers by the standards of serpents and dragons. The standard of Revelation 12. But they should, by the blast of trumpets, unite with traitors. Traitors, but traitors, trading your life to give up your belief in God's word. What an astounding thing, brothers and sisters. We can only just imagine the drama of that time. But what I want to leave you with is this. Think about your brothers and sisters in that time. Reading Revelation 12, seeing all these events being fulfilled, think about how they must have felt. And they cried unto Despotes, how long, O Lord, Despotes, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood upon the earth? And they saw that come to fruition. Pagan Rome disappeared, oh, but in came a terrible persecutor. And that persecutor has gone on one century after another century after another century. One day we're going to meet our brothers and sisters who saw that as prophecy. And we're going to ask them, how did they ever overcome? And they're going to turn to you and they're going to ask you how you overcome the awful persecution that they know is the only lot for those who are in Christ. They knew nothing else. They knew nothing else. It was persecution. To live in Christ was to be persecuted and have to stand up for your thing and ask you at the judgment seat, how did you overcome the persecution? But that's all they know. What are you going to say? Well, it was tough. The lecture and the study class went over 10 minutes. It was tough. Or there was a brother in the hall that I didn't get on with and we had bad words and I had to go on. It was tough. Are we going to feel ashamed, embarrassed? When we stand next to our brothers and sisters who went through that? I'm not saying we have to go through and be killed and be slain, brothers. But think about our brothers and sisters. No wonder when Christ comes. And in the chapter 14 of Revelation, where an angel stands there with a sharp signal, ready to reap the vintage of the earth, he doesn't move. He doesn't move until another angel comes out of the altar and says, go. Who do you reckon that angel is? Who do you reckon those brothers and sisters are that come out of the altar? Those ones who knew the persecution of pagan Rome, who knew the persecution of Catholic Rome. They're the ones that are going to say, go, go, and reap the vintage of the earth. Can't wait for that to happen, brothers and sisters. And to stand with our brothers and sisters and talk to them about the Bible class that we had about their era. What a glorious thing that will be. So thank you, brothers and sisters, for welcoming Sister Christine into your midst and for the fellowship that we have surely been shown in abundance in our brief trip that we have had thus far in the United Kingdom. May God bless us all in our journey as we wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, well, thank you for joining us for these two episodes. I hope you enjoyed them. You can watch the video versions of these episodes over on the Bible channel on YouTube. 
Um, the correct title is The Bible Channel, Discover the Bible. Or you could go over to christadelphianvideo.org where they also feature there and you can locate them under Brother Stephen Hornhart's own page under the search for speaker section. Please do let us know what you thought and what kind of material you would like us to upload to these podcasts. Um, and we pray that God may bless you in your studies of his word, that his name may be glorified. Thank you for listening.